Well, good morning. I worked very hard last week. It was, it was hard work on the beaches of Mexico, uh, winning the lost on the missions trip down there. <laughs> yeah, no, Heather and I were in, in Mexico last week, and so we were able to get some sun, spend time with uh, about 250 pastors down in Mexico last week, and so it was a good time. It's good to be back this morning. Now i got a story for you. Oh, i, I got to remember to do this. Next week, we will not be taking an offering. We will not be doing announcements. That will be as you come in, as you go out, there will be ushers who will be prepared to take your offering when you're coming in. You can just do that or give online through the Bethel's Rock app or website. Um, but the announcements will be on the screen. You'll be handed announcements um, to look at, encourage you to do that, or you'll miss great things like the marriage retreat that's coming up. You'll miss the encounter retreat that's coming up. You'll miss a lot of things if you don't get that in that form when they hand it to you or watch the, uh, the screen on the, in the lobby. We're going to actually go right from worship into the message and then into prayer uh, each Sunday. We're going to do that for the month of February, and so I want to encourage you to prepare for that. Well, great story I heard of this little boy who's in the backyard. And I don't know if you remember this. I love this story because I remember doing this. You know, you throw the ball in the air and you grab the bat and you, you hit the ball. How many did that when they were a kid? Well, this little boy was doing that. And he's like, he's, he's in the backyard and he goes, greatest hitter of all time. And he throws the ball up and he swings in, swings so hard that he falls over and the ball lands on the ground. And he gets up, grabs the bat, grabs the ball, and he goes, greatest hitter, swings as hard as he can, Falls to the ground. Well, he gets back up, takes the bat, grabs the ball, throws it in the air and says, greatest, swings and misses it again. Pitcher of all time. <laughs> Some of you, I didn't get it. Yeah, pitcher, he pitched. In the... Okay. <laughs> We, uh, <laughs> that wasn't funny. <laughs> we are a movement. And if you missed the last few messages, uh, I encourage you to go online to watch those messages. We are a movement. We personally are a movement. We're part of a movement we call Bethel's Rock. And there are movements like that all over the city, great movements of God. But we're also part of a global movement. That, that this, this morning, all over the United States, people are coming together to worship together and to worship the name of Jesus. That before you were even up, before you went to bed last night, there were people who woke up in their morning to praise Jesus all together in a group. There is a global movement of one billion people that you're a part of. That you are not alone, you're part of a great movement of God that is crisscrossing the globe right now. And the Bible says in Revelation, it says there will be a witness to every people group in the world. There is that currently. All over the world, there's the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached. And you and I are part of this great mission. We have a post in this great mission. I'm going to show you Ezekiel. I'm not going to read a story in Ezekiel today as I have the last few weeks and I encourage you to do that. But here's what it says in Ezekiel 33, 7. So you, son of man, any son of men in here? Yeah. Any daughters of men in here? Yeah. All right? Okay. Referring to both of you, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. You are a watchman on the wall. You've been given a post. You've been given a post, and he gives you the word to share with the people that come to that post, wherever that post is. Wherever you're posted, you are a watchman on the wall. Whether you're a good watchman or a bad watchman, well, that's between you and the Lord. But I can tell you right now that every one of us in here are watchmen. We all have the same mission statement, which is to... Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every living being, to every, every person on the globe. That's our, that's our mission statement. We, we all have different superhero powers. 
We all have different superpowers. Whether you're a hero or not is whether you're saving people or not. You may have superpowers like Superman or Batman or Robin or whatever it is to do supernatural things, but until you use it to save people, you're not a superhero. And, and, and that's really, you know, I'm not one of those adventure guys. I don't like those movies. I don't like all, but this is the most, this is the most clear revelation of what God's talking about. I believe that, that there ever, this is, this is a, a powerful revelation when you realize that God hasn't called Johnny down the, down the road from you or Sally down the road from you, that he has called you to be his watchman on the wall to do, to do what? To go either for, well, I don't believe that everyone is supposed to, then the Bible is a liar and we might as well throw it out. That every one of us have been given the command. He said, I made you a watchman for the house of Israel. You've been made, and I'm going to give you the word that's going to help set people free. You're, you're going to experience the supernatural word of God come to you, and you're going to give the word, and you're going to set people free. Now, uh, often, you know, when I go play golf or, or I'm on a plane, you know, I'll get talking to people. I was talking to people. I don't always, I don't always like... Um, you know, you know, telling people that I'm a pastor usually because the moment they see that, they start thinking about all of the things they just said, and it gets awkward real quick. And so, but I overheard, I overheard someone tell me what, what they did like when they're on a plane, and, and he said, you know, when I get it, and they ask me what I do, I don't tell them I'm a pastor or reverend. I tell them I'm, I'm an agent of a global organization. <laughs> a global movement. And so this is a great way. Somebody asks you, what do you do? Now, 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 now listen to this, because I, I really want you to start thinking this way. You may be in business, but you are not a businessman. You may be in medicine, but you are not a doctor. You may be in physical therapy, but you're not a therapist. You may be a plumber, but you're not a plumber. Your identity is not in what you do. You are a son of God, a daughter of God. That is who you are. You are a believer. Do you know that in the early church, they didn't refer to people by what they did for employment. They referred to them as Christians, the people who are turning the world upside down. They are the way. They are the believers. That's who, I, who we are. And so, so you are an agent in a global organization. And he said, you know, they'll ask, well, really? You're an agent? He says, yeah, we, we have a global organization. Well, what does your organization do? And, he's, and, and they said, well, we have an outlet in almost every city in the globe, all over the place. It's a movement. We have hospitals, homeless shelters, orphanages, feeding programs, justice work, reconciliation work, counseling, immigration work, coaching, Basically, we help people from birth to death. And we deal in the area of behavioral alterations. <laughs> really? What is the name of this organization? The church. That's what we are. We are part of a global movement. We are part of the church. There is still no greater movement on the planet that's changing the world than the church. And that's who we are. We are not just this, this group that meets in this room that's comparatively small to, to a lot of other places around the world, but we are part of that movement. And, and the world, and there are even leaders that are trying to separate us from other people in the church to say, well, they're, they're not as good as you are. We're the best, and they're all the rest. Wrong. Meh. We're all part of one movement. We may be a movement within a movement within the movement, but it is still the movement. It's called the global church of Jesus Christ. There is no greater movement within the movement. When I say the movement, I mean you individually are a movement. Within the movement of Bethel's Rock, within the movement of the church, each of those movements all along the way have been divined and created by God to fulfill a purpose. Each one of us 
have, been a, have a movement or been created for that. This church has a movement. Part of that movement is to be a diverse, diversely integrated church. Internationally diverse. And you look around, we see people all around of different races and nationalities all around you. Because that's what I believe God has called us to be. That's who we are as B-Rock. Right? The Bible says in Acts 1.8, it says this. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. You shall be my preachers. You shall be the ones that go out and tell people about Jesus. You shall be the ones that share the good news of Jesus. You shall be the ones that heal the sick. You shall be the ones that deliver people from discouragement and depression. You shall be the ones that tell people about the word of God and how it will set them free. You shall be the ones that show them what it is to be a believer. You shall be when? When the Holy, the power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Does anyone have the Holy Spirit upon them? Then we are to tell people. We are to go out and be witnesses of the truth of the gospel in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That means you don't want to go on a missions trip. Get over it. Right? Some of you just, you know, well, whatever. You know what the problem is? The problem is, is that many Christians have taken seriously what Jesus said to three disciples. See that you tell no one. You know, some of them are like Arctic rivers. They're frozen at the mouth. They, 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 they say, Lord, and especially Pentecostal people tend to say, God, give me more. I want more, more, God, more. You know, and, and they end up being constipated. Because they keep getting more, but they don't move anything out. Are you with me this morning? We sit there and we go to church and all we want is more, but we're not giving anything. We're not going out and reaching. So we're walking around like constipated believers, speaking in tongues or doing whatever it is you do, and, and, and you're not giving anything. You're not witnessing. You know, more to God than anything else, he wants us to go into the world. The great commission is to go into the world. You know, some of the reasons why people never accept Christ as their Savior is because they've either never met a Christian or they met a Christian. You know, I remember uh, a number of, well, a couple of years ago, uh, my daughter Mackenzie was going to go out and she was going to go rollerblading. And she was out rollerblading and Heather said, well, you need to be back before it gets dark. And it was in the summer, so it was later in the evening. And, and uh, she didn't show up when she was supposed to show up. And, you know, my sweet, loving, caring wife that you think never is bossy ever, <laughs> oh, that you would know. Right, I'm the meek, sweet one, and, <laughs> right, well, my wife, she turns into another woman, when, I mean, the woman has watched too many 2020s, you know, her daughter's not home, surely she's been kidnapped, and they're butchering her as we speak, all right, how, how many, right, and that's, and so she's, she's like, Mackenzie's not home, and it starts with a rumble, and it just starts, you know, Mackenzie's not home, and she's, ah, she'll be fine. Right? The guys are all like, yeah, she'll be fine. It's good. She said, Mackenzie, she needs to be getting home. Like, and then, then she starts calling her phone and then doesn't answer the phone. And then every call, she starts getting worked up. And, you know, Heather's fine. You mess with her kids, though, she turns into a lion. Like, right? And then she starts getting real bossy. And she's like, girls, the twitch, she didn't start out with me, but she said, Bailey and Bianca, get, get on your bikes. You need to go and get, I said, Heather, it'll be fine. Don't worry. It ain't fine. She's supposed to be home. Something has happened to her. I just, a mama knows when something's happened to her child. Right? And then, so Bailey and Bianca are like, she's fine, mom. Like, get on your bikes. You go to the east. You go to the west. Oh, what is that, Mom? <laughs> you know, no, I used to was. You go that way. You go that way. And 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 and, and J- James, get up off that thing. Well, the game is. She'll be back. She'll be fine. Get up. You're going out. And she's she's yelling us all out of the house, right? <laughs> and she gets out, and you can hear her in the neighborhood. Mackenzie. 
right? She doesn't care what the neighbors think. She doesn't care if they think she's a weirdo or a freak because her baby's lost. Mackenzie! Of course, Mackenzie came around just like Dad said. <laughs> do, 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 do. She just comes around the corner and everything's fine. It, it, it wasn't fine after she got home. <laughs> Mackenzie to find was Mackenzie, you're in trouble. <laughs> right? You know, if you think about it, when I would often take all three girls out when they were small. If, if at, at one point I had said, you know, called home and said, honey, I got to tell you, I just, I got good news. Um, I've lost McKinsey, but I still have the other two. <laughs> just want you to know I have, uh, I'm, why are you upset? You know, I, because, because when one is lost, you forget about what you have to get the one that's lost. See, we, get, we worship in church as if God's more excited about those he has than he's worried about those who are lost. God's mind is not about giving us more. His mind is about saving those with none. And like the mother, like Heather, Mackenzie! God is sitting there saying, you're my voice to witness, to shout out to a lost world that I love them, to call them home. See, we get caught up with more of, to so say, God, well, we got the nine. He left the nine to go find the one that was lost. This is an extremely important mission for the church. It's to win people to Christ. I don't want to send, sit here at the end of your life doing a funeral, and, and, and you know, if I'm still alive at that time doing your funeral, I don't want to sit here and say, you know what the sad part is? They lived 70 years and never won anyone to Jesus. You say, this isn't a really encouraging message. It will be once you win someone to Jesus. <laughs> How many know sometimes we need just a little kick in the pants? Do you know, you know what, six, what our success in the ki kingdom is measured by? Not how great we sing. It's by the lost we bring in. Taking the, the love of Jesus to people who don't know it. And yeah, some people aren't going to receive it. But many are. The fields are white unto harvest. The fruit is ripe. And we are watchmen on the wall. Some would say, I don't know why this poem is in my message. Um, to be honest with you, um, the Lord just kept bringing it back up again and again. And so I'm going to read it to you. It's a, it's a poem that I remember seeing, I think, on one of my grandparents' walls. I always relate this poem to old people, right, of which I'm not. I'm, I'm very young. But I think it's because I always saw it in my grandparents' kitchen. Here's what it is. It's called the touch of the master's hand. Many of you have heard it, I'm sure. Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it hardly worth his while to waste his time on the old violin. But he held it up with a smile. What, I, what am I bid, good people, he cried. Who starts the bidding for me? One dollar, one dollar, do I hear a two? Two dollars, who makes it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, three going for three, but no. From the room far back, a gray-bearded man came forward to pick up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as an angel sings. The music ceased and, ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, What now am I, am I bid for this old violin, as he held it aloft with its bow? One thousand, one thousand, do I hear two? Two thousand, who makes it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going, gone, said he. The audience cheered, but some of them cried. We just don't understand. What changed its worth? Swift came the reply. It was the touch of the master's hand. And many a, a man with a life out of tune, all battered and bruised with hardship, is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin. A mess, a pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that it wrought by the touch of the master's hand. See, See, every person in this room, somebody came to you and shared the good news. You were worth it to share the good news. Who is in our life right now that God loves so much and he wants us to be the one going, 
Mackenzie! Can God use your voice? He's using the voices of people all around the world to call in the lost to come home. Will you give them permission to use your voice? Will you give them permission to be the watchman on the wall? You know, watchmen in this watchman movement, in this global movement, it will only move forward when we pray. Point number one here is when we pray, the movement of prayer. There was a pastor's family who had just gotten a new little kitten. He'd just gotten a new little kitten, and uh, they, they wanted to give the kitten some confidence. So they took the kitten outside, and, and they placed the kitten up into a tree, up on a, a, the big limb in a tree. And they placed the kitten up there. And when the kitten got up on the tree, scared, it took up running off the tree and climbed up as high as it can onto a limb. And when it got up on the limb that was high up where they couldn't reach it anymore, he, he slipped, this little kitten slipped and was about to fall but caught himself on the limb. And he was hanging on the limb, just swinging. And he, he was so light, he, he didn't have the mass to be able to swing himself back up on, on the tree. And so he's hanging on this limb uh, from the tree and, and the children that were watching it's like oh daddy who is a pastor who's watching it and, and they're like daddy daddy we can't get the kitten he's going to fall you got to help get the kitten well uh, you know knowing that dads have all the perfect advice in the world how many dads should have said amen there I mean they had a TV show on it called Father Knows Best right the dad came up with a, with a strategy he says what we're going to do is we're going to tie a rope we're going to tie it up on the limb, and we're going to tie the other end of the rope to my bumper of my car. And we're going to pull the limb down, and then we'll go, and then we'll pull the limb down, and you can grab the kitten. So, good plan, Daddy. Good plan, Daddy. Way to rescue the kitten, right? And uh, I loved it when my kids were that age, and everything you did was super. <laughs> now they're older, and everything you do is... <laughs> Anyway, uh, they tied the rope. <laughs> you, you can fill in the blank. Tied the, tied the rope, and, and, and Daddy slowly, slowly pulled, and the limb went slowly, slowly down, and slowly, slowly, and the limb went slowly, slowly down, and then bam! The rope popped. The kid went flying through the air. That's the end of the story. <laughs> Not every story has a good story. A couple of weeks later, the pastor goes on a visitation, and he knocks on the door of this house, and, and the lady came to the door and opens the door, and he walks into the house, and wouldn't you know it, there's their kitten. It was undeniable. There was their kitten. It was their kitten. And he, he talked to Lay for a while and says, oh, a new kitten. Have you had it long? And uh, she goes, oh, pastor, you're never going to believe this story. Saturday morning, we were out in the garden. My son was asking for a kitten. And I kept telling him, we are not getting a kitten. But he just pestered me and pestered me and pestered me. And so I said to him, okay, fine. We'll pray. If Jesus wants you to have a kitten, we'll ask him to give you a kitten. So we knelt and pray. And pastor, you will never believe what happened next. It's interesting, when you pray, coincidences happen. When you don't, they don't. When you pray, coincidences happen, and when you don't pray, they don't happen. Prayer, if we're going to see people come to Christ, we need to pray for people to come to Christ. If you have family members that need to get, get saved, you need to pray for people, those family members to be saved. Or they're not just going to be... I've said this many times, and the thing I think that is quite... What, the thing I think that keeps people from praying is that we feel that if, if, if it's God's will, then it'll just happen. Can I tell you... It's God's desire for something to happen, but until you pray for it to happen, it's not going to happen. So let me ask you a question. How many people in your life has God wanted to be saved through your life that have not been saved because you haven't prayed for them? Or how many things in your life God has wanted to do in your life, but because we haven't asked him to do, we haven't prayed and talk to God and spend time with God to talk to him and pray it, prayed it from heaven to earth. 
your kingdom will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We move it. We're the portal that moves it from the, super, from the from heavenly realm into the earthly realm. We move it. Prayer works. And, and the question is, are we praying for people? You know, one in 20 believers pray for the lost. One in 20 believers pray for the lost. That's an international number. One in 20, but in the United States, it's far worse. Wow. Are you with me this morning? Okay. Now, there's a couple of things I'm going to give you. There are a couple of things I'm going to give you. Number one, how many, if you walk, how many walk around their neighborhood? Just wave their hand, wave your hand at me. You walk. Okay. Now, rather than walking around your neighborhood talking about how ugly that house is and how you would never do that and, uh, with the plants and, and uh, that is the ugliest looking door I've ever seen or where do they get all their money to be able to do that? You know, instead of doing that, let me encourage you to do something else. Let me encourage you that when you go out and walk, and you should, everyone should take a walk, go out into your neighborhood, begin walking around your neighborhood praying for people in your neighborhood. Be, go out and begin praying for the lost in your neighborhood. You don't need to even know their name. Lord, I pray for the people in this home. Whatever's going on, I just lift up that you would make yourself aware of the home. Give me an opportunity to get to know those people in that home so that I can share the gospel of Jesus with them. Open up opportunities that I could tell them about the Lord. See, we could come to church and we can have great services. If no one gets saved, we failed. People are going to hell. People are going to hell. More people right now in our world are on their way to hell than are going to heaven. We have people who are being credentialed to be ministers that have never won anyone to Christ in their life. But they know how to do a good show. They know how to communicate. They're such good communicators. They make us feel really good, but no one gets saved. No one experiences the love of Christ. No one experiences the forgiveness of sin. We, we are that witness. We are the voice of God saying, Mackenzie! That's us. That's what we are to the Father. So, so here's the next thing. Take prayer walks. Pray for people in your neighborhood. Here's the next thing. At any given time, if you're part of the B-Rock movement, have three people that you're praying for that do not know Christ that you're praying for to be saved at any given time. Write, down, write them down. Even as, we're pre as I'm preaching right now, the Lord is giving those who don't have three names. The Lord is going to give you three names of people that do not know Jesus, that need Jesus in their life. How many believe that the only way to heaven is Jesus Christ? Is that right? That there's no other way. There's no other religion. There's no other faith. There's no other way to, 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 to cry to the Father in heaven but through Christ, right? Jesus himself said that. See, you can't be a follower of Jesus and not believe that. And if, if he's the only way, then we have a responsibility to get people in the way. So write down the three names of people in your life that do not know Jesus Christ and then begin praying for those three people that you would have the opportunity to see them saved that they would come to Christ and pray for them every day. And if you skip a day, don't get all con condemned and uh, you know, now they're going to hell because I missed the day. No, pray, just pray. Don't, don't, this isn't a condemnation thing. This is a victory thing. Right now, some of you are not taking serious what I'm saying right now, but this is a very serious thing. You know, I'm not down there preaching and, and doing all that stuff and work. That We need to win the lost. And we do that through a number of different venues, but it starts with prayer. You know, there's been an assault on prayer. An assault on prayer. Literally, the enemy has gotten us to believe that prayer doesn't change anything. But it, nothing will move without it. We have to pray. We have to pray. So will you do this right now? Um... Everybody think of one person that's not saved. And then, when you think of that person, raise your hand. Okay, some of you aren't raising your hand because you think I don't see you. If, when you think of the one person that's not, and some of you are raising them now, I don't know who, but I'm raising it because he said to raise it, right? Okay, raise it. Everyone has a hand raised. Look to, the, to, look to both ways. Does everyone have a hand? And if not, point at them. Say, they don't. Okay. Okay, yeah, people are raising it, just raise it. Now that's good. 
Okay, now what we're going to do for the next minute is I want you just to pray for that person. However you want to do it, you can put your hands down. Just begin praying for that person by name. Just say their name many times. Lord, I bring this person. Begin to pray right now that they would come to Christ. Pray for them right now. Yes. Okay. That was one minute. If you would pray for that person for one minute, how many believe that person would get saved? They wouldn't have a chance. Right? I'm, what, what, I'm asking you to have three people that you're going to pray for, but for the person you thought of, when that person gets saved in 2017, I want you to email me and say that person got saved. Does that sound good? How many believe this person's getting saved because I'm, I'm going to be an agent in the kingdom of God that's going to do everything in my power to lead this person to Christ, okay? Here's the second one, watchman movement. In the watchman movement, we, we care. The spirit of God gives us combat, compassion. We're, you know, we're not naturally compassionate people. We're typically selfish people, right? If you need proof of it, the next time you take a picture... How do you determine whether it's a good picture or not? The first thing you look at is not everyone else in the picture. Oh, you look so good in that picture. Let's keep it. If you don't look good, you don't. It, 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 literally, it says, let, let, let me see the picture. Oh, yeah, we should keep that one. That's good. And if you don't like yourself in the picture, okay, come, everyone come back in. Let's take another one. All right? People don't care how much we know until they believe and how much we care. We need to care about people. And one of the things got that what, we live in a world where I do what's best for me. That's what's, this is what's best for me. And you know, a thing that I've heard some people say recently, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this thing because it will look good on my resume. Resume for what? If you're always building your resume, what is it that you're looking to do? Everything that God puts us in, every place God puts us in has a purpose in itself. And, and there are people who are part of that purpose. And we are to care about them. And to show them that people are important. They're important to God. You know, there's a woman by the name of Rosie Fossine. i got to go back up here. There's a, there's a, there's a woman, she, Rosie Fossine. She was a greeter for us for many years. And she's now in a nursing home, and she always wears a little flower in her hair. How many know Rosie, right? Well, Rosie is on the last few days of her life. She's now in the nursing home. Uh, uh, she's coming to the end of her life. I went to visit her before we went to Mexico, and when I went in, she's sitting in there. I encourage you to go up to Apple Valley to Augustana Care Center. She loves having people. When I went there, she was in a room with a bunch of just brokenness, just a lot of, and she's sitting by herself just staring at a wall. I can tell you that breaks your heart when you see them. We sat down and we were talking. And, and I have a video of Rosie. I was going to show it to you this morning. but don't have the time to do it. But Rosie, in the video, I, I videoed her on my phone. And she was saying, you know what I've discovered? That more important than anything else in my life, all of the accomplishments, all of the stuff I have, all my possessions, all I really care about are my, the, my friends, the relationships in my life. People are the only important thing to me. And in that moment, the only thing she wants, she doesn't want another great meal. She doesn't want another car. You know what she wants in that moment, what she wants even now? She wants her friends to be there. She wants to tell them how important they were to her. Because in the end, the thing that, we, that is most valuable in our life and we give almost little time to is our relationships. The people in our life. And, and there are people in our life that God wants us to reach out to. The Apostle Paul's passion and movement changed him. It changed him from being selfish to volunteering, pursuing something. In 1 Corinthians 9.19, it says this. Even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all. I'm not bound. I don't need to do this to be saved. I'm not doing good acts because that's what you do to be saved. However, now that I'm free, I choose to care about people. I choose to go and bless people. I choose to love people. I choose to go out and to add value to people. That's why in your workplace, wherever you work or in your neighborhood, there are people in those places that nobody cares about. You know, the rejected, the ones who are weird, 
The ones, everybody kind of, they, they, they're just kind of the ones that you're not cool if you spend time with them or, or they're kind of boring to be around in your own mind. Those are the people that Paul looked at and said, I voluntarily looked for those people and I'm going to come and add value to them. I'm going to share how much Jesus loves them by loving them, by listening to their boring stories and laughing at their jokes. even the ones you don't like, right? Paul voluntarily did that. He didn't need to do it because he was going to get something from it because it's unnatural to serve others. It's not natural to serve others. And yet Paul did that. Look at Philippians 2, 1 through 8. It says, if, if you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor, agree with each other, love each other, be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Now, I know I am preaching something so contrary to this world. Their idea is step on other people to push you up. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves as the, the way that Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so of himself, that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. That was the son of God. You know what Christianity means? It means follower of Christ. You know what a follower of anybody does? They follow the example of the person they're following. The follower of Christ, the Christian, by definition, becomes a slave when they could be deity. You serve people, became human. Having become human, human he stayed human. You know that Jesus is still human today? He has a human body, flesh says in revelations they see the lamb beaten he stayed human it was incredibly humbling in process he didn't claim special special privileges instead he lived a selfless obedient life and then died selfless obedient a selfless obedient death and the worst kind of death at that a crucifixion and why did he do it he did it for you you know, let me ask you questions. Do the neighbors know you as the neighbor from heaven or the neighbor from hell? Or do they even know you? It's interesting because neighbors can recognize that there's something different about you. Whether you're a roommate of someone or whether you live closely next to them, they know that there's something different about you when you're in Christ. We are resurrected people with supernatural powers there is a light that shines through us that people can recognize when we begin to reach them with the love of Jesus. You know, Apostle Paul movement included everyone. It includes everyone. When you care about people, you include everyone. Look at what it says. And in, in, he says, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralist, loose living immoralist, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. Black, white, Asian, from a different country, you reach everyone. Now, I've addressed this on numerous occasions. I'm going to address it again because I'm not letting it go and you're just hoping I'll forget about it. I'm not going to forget about it. We are a diverse church but we are not an integrated church. And part of the problem is that we refuse to spend time with people outside our comfort zone. We don't understand the culture. We struggle to understand the, the way they talk. And, 
And, and instead of it being in, you know, if you're white in this place or if you're an American in this place, white, but we are not a very hospitable culture. We're terrible. You go to Cuba, if you're new into their country, you go to Cuba, they have you in their house, staying with them. We're not very hospitable. We have people come in and, and they're from another, oh, praise God, so glad to have you here. Come and sit over there. Sit with your peeps. You know, I've thought we need to have once a month a don't sit with your peeps Sunday service. I mean, husband and wife should sit together. But beyond that, you should sit by people you do not know and get to know them. It's the only way we're going to get to know people from other places that we're not comfortable with. The only way we're going to grow beyond this, this, this very rigid, inward focus mentality that all of us have. And it's not just white people. It's, it's if they're from Indonesia. It's comfortable to be around people from Indonesia, right? But it needs the end. You need to have white people to your house and cook food that they don't know what it is. Just to see them, just to get a laugh out of it. Like cook stuff you don't normally even eat. Like just make something, say it's some weird thing. It's just, just to see their face. You know, because we're part of a family, the family of the kingdom of God, and God has blessed us with, a, we're, we're together geographically, but we're not together in our heart. We may be diverse and integrated in the sense of in the church, but we're not integrated in our heart. I can't make you do that. You have to make that move. You have to, you have to go to the Lord and say, God, I, I need, I, for, forgive me. Forgive me. Help me. And I, I'm not ending this thing. I'm pushing this thing for this whole year. You need to get together with people of different cultures from you. And you need to do it after we leave the service. You need to say, hey, you don't look like you're from here. <laughs> or if you're not from here, you need to say, you really look like you're from Minnesota. You're really white, <laughs> pasty white, you know. Amen. All right. So you look like you're from here. Can you come over to my house? It should not be said of people visiting from other countries that they have never been in the home of an American in this, in this city. But there are people in this room right now that have never been in an American home because Americans have never invited them into their home. Well, my home's messed up. Do you know that when I was in Mich Michigan, I renovated a house and we bought a dump and then I tore it apart and my wife We'd go to church, they'd pat her on the shoulder and dust, drywall dust would come off her dress. <laughs> she was more, but she'd come home crying because she was so mad. But literally, I'd have complete walls missing, like drywall where you could see all the electric wires. And we had little kids, our carpet was terrible. Kids throw stuff on the carpet, we'd be like, oh well. Right? And we'd have people at our house. Because if they got a problem, that's just where we're at, it's who we are. Don't let those things keep you from developing relationships with each other. Don't let your home or your situation keep you from inviting people in your home and making you richer and closer with other people in Christ because those are the people who will end up being your best friends. Are you with me? Have you noticed I've said that a lot? Because I can go in a direction and look behind me and none of you are there. It's okay sometimes to say, Amen! Let me know you're there. Right? I would even encourage some of you to invite yourself to other people's homes. <laughs> I'll be there a Friday night. I cannot have pizza because I've had that every day this week. If you're single in this place, do that often. And find a married couple and say, I'm coming to your house. I like chicken wings. <laughs> right? When I go to my parents' house, I, don't, I, I just say, hey, I'm coming on Friday. I'm staying tonight. I don't ask, can I come? How many know your parents' house is your house for as long as they shall live? <laughs> right? Parents' food's your food as long as they shall live. I'm going to right? You don't ask. You just, it's just the way it is. 
God does not give us a movement so we can accept it. He accepts us so we can give us, so he can give us a movement, a movement to people. He, here's, the, here's the last thing. Oh, I got to say this. By the way, Apostle Paul's movement required him to like people. You truly find out a lot about yourself when you leave your culture. You can't minister to people you do not like. You have to like people. And so maybe God needs to transform something in your heart so you like people. The last one is Watchman Movement is to share. We share. We share. You know, there's, there's uh, orchard. Uh, Jesus said the fields are white unto harvest, right? There's an orchard. If you go into a fruit orchard, there's fruit on the trees. You know when the fruit is ripe. You go up and you pluck off the fruit. You don't pluck it before it's ripe. You pluck it ripe. There are, there are many people who are ready to be saved. But if, if ripe fruit does not get plucked out of the tree, what happens to the fruit? It falls to the ground and it dies. How many people have died when they were ripe for the picking, but no one felt like the, they were great about, you know, planting the seeds. I planted the seed. Well, maybe they were ready to be saved. Well, I didn't want to go there. Well, why not? Because I didn't want rejection. I didn't want to turn them off. Turn them off by asking, would you like to pray right now to invite Jesus in your life? What if they had said yes? If they say no, oh well. But what if they say yes? Well, then what would I do? You would pray with them. <laughs> but I have never prayed friend that's getting back to point one that's why we need to start praying with people see we have become so seeker friendly that the church has died on the vine because we haven't taught the church to pray with each other and we don't go to prayer meetings anymore because we don't want to leave our comfort zone to pray with someone because we're too afraid of what people might think if we pray for them. And if it doesn't sound really good, then, 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 then what will they think of me as a Christian if I don't sound? What they'll think of you as a Christian is that you haven't prayed for people a lot lately. Actually, they won't think anything. They're more worried about how they sound when they pray. There are people going to hell that desperately need us to get over ourselves and to be the watchman on the wall. We need to be the watchman on the wall. You know, a pregnant lady, six months before they're ready to give birth, you don't get on a pregnant lady and try to push the baby out. We need to get the baby. You let the baby grow in the womb. Sometimes there are times where you go, you push, that's not there. You wait until the baby's ready and you come back. And wait until the baby's ready. There are times where people aren't going to say where it's a process where you're moving along. But there are times when they are ready and it is time to give birth. And we need to be ready to be there to, to help them through that process. Our movement is our gift. I want to do something tonight, today. Tonight. Um, it's a little different. Uh, than how we typically end a sermon. In fact, it is very uncomfortable. And the only people who are really exempt from this is a visitor. And if you've been here more than three times, you're no longer a visitor. Don't get evangelistic. I've only been here three. You've been here a year. Don't tell me you've been here only, only three, you know, three. Okay. Here, here's what we're going to do, and, and, and I, I did this in the first service, and it's uncomfortable, to be quite honest with you. It's uncomfortable because you know what we like? We love to come to church. We love to put on the show. We love you to do singing. We love to feel good. We love to hear great work. We love all of that stuff, but we, the, the purpose of the church is to equip and empower every one of us in this room to do the work of ministry, right? And so what, what we're going to have you do is look around you, look around you, Look around you. See who's around you. Okay. Scope it out. Find one person that you like. No, better yet. Find one person you don't like. <laughs> no getting out of here, Markel. <laughs> Find someone you're not married to, but is of the same sex of yours. You may just stand there, maybe close where you don't need to, be, need to get up. Maybe you're just turning to somebody. Turn to them right now and pray for them right now. Just, yeah, you may need to adjust. You may move, move a little bit to adjust, but just you're going to pray together just as one-on-one, one-on-one, 